So in this video, I'm going to be covering section 4-1 for chapter 4, probability. 4-1 is a introduction into probability. Uh, so let's just get started. Uh, so in this pre-skill, uh, the problem asks, uh, find the fraction of female students for each problem below, and then write the fraction as a decimal rounded to four decimal places. Okay, so uh, problem A, in a math class, there are 36 female students and 17 male students. And again, the problem is asking us two parts. The first part is to find the fraction of female students. Uh, so let's see, there's... Um, 36 female students, right? So that's the part. So fraction, if you guys recall, a fraction is just just part over whole, right? So the part which consists of the females is 36, and the the um, the whole. So in, in the whole would be the entire math class. So the entire math class consists of 36 students uh, plus the 17 male students. So that's going to be 53, right? So I'm just adding the 36 with the 17 to get the 53. Okay. Uh, and then the second part of the question says to turn that fraction into a decimal rounded to four decimal places. Uh, so that's pretty simple enough, right? We're just going to uh, take the 36. This is 36 divided by 53. Right, so any fraction can be turned into a decimal by doing the numerator divided by the denominator. Right, so that's what we get. Uh, and then we're going to round to four decimal places. So the, the digit in the round off spot is the two here. Uh, and then uh, the four here does not increase it, increase the two. So this is approximately 0 0.6792. Okay, uh, let's see. Number two. Or, or question B, in a writing class, there are two female students and 55 male students. So that's going to be, so the part is two, right? The part which are females is two. And then the uh, whole, the whole is the entire class, which consists of 57 students. So that's, again, I'm just combining the two female students with the 55 male students to get the 57. And then we can change this to a fraction as well, right? So for the, for C, uh, history class, we have 51 female students and no male students. So all female students, no male students. So that's going to be 51 out of 51. And then for um, uh, D, we have no female students and 51 male students. So that's going to be 0 over 51. And then E, um, if a student is randomly selected in each class above. Okay, so let's... Let's hold off on E first. Let's let's work out the fraction or the decimals for uh, the rest of them. So, for example, uh, question B, uh, 2 over 57 is 2 divided by 57 uh, is approximately 0 0.35, oops, 0 0.0, 0 0.0351. And then let's go ahead and box these answers, these decimals. Um, 51 over 51, any fraction where you have a whole number over itself is 1, right? And you can work it out if you'd like. like 51 divided by 51 is equal to 1. And then zero, uh, 0 over 51 is equal to 0. Okay, so now let's answer question E. So question E says, if a student is randomly selected in each class above, describe the chances the chance of selecting a female student. So if you randomly select one student from each of these classes, so the math class, the writing class, history class, the biology class, what are, how would you describe the chances of uh, selecting um, uh, of that student, that one student you're selecting is going to be a female student? So for the math class, you have a pretty good chance, right? It's not uh, a very, very good chance, but it's more than a 50-50 chance, right? Uh, for this one, your chances are very small or, or kind of pretty small, right? Because there's only two students, two female students out of 57. So pretty small chance of you selecting um, a student who is a female. For this class, for the history class, for sure you're going to select a female because they're all female students. So if you select one student, you're for certain you're going to get a female. And then 
uh, in the biology class, you are not going to get a female. Your chances are are zero. So you, um, it's impossible, right? So this one for sure you're going to get a female. This one, um, for sure you are not going to get a female. It's impossible to get a female. All right. So that's what uh, probability is. It, it describes the chances of of um, uh, of an event occurring, the likelihood of an event occurring. All right, so we have some definitions and some uh, some definitions that I want to go through that it's important for you guys to know. So probability is the likelihood of an event occurring. Uh, it is expressed as a value between zero to one. And where you have the following. So let me kind of zoom in. So zero, is impossible the event cannot occur similar to how we would not be able to select a female student in the biology class where there's no female student right uh, and then one is for sure that it's going to happen it's just like similar to how we have it up here where if it's all female students your chances of selecting female students is for certain so the closer you get to one the, the closer the probability is to one the the more likely the event is going to occur and then the closer the probability is to zero the more unlikely the prob uh, the the event is going to occur and in, in the middle we have uh, 0.5 is which is a 50 50 chance all right so in any uh, in a um, situation where we're talking about probability an outcome is a possible result of a procedure an event is any collection of outcomes of a procedure and then the sample space for a procedure consists of all possible outcomes. So let's take a quick, just like a like a like a brief or quick example, uh, and describe it in terms of like what are examples of outcomes, events, and the sample space. So for example, if you're rolling a six-sided die, uh, examples of outcomes would be like rolling uh, a one, right, or a three. Or whatnot, so dot dot dot, right? So those are examples of outcomes, and we know there is six possible outcomes, right? It's just you're rolling from one to three. Oh, I'm sorry, one to six. So the sample space is like all of the outcomes, right? One, two, three, four, five, and six. All right, and then an example of the event is something. Uh, an event is pretty much a description that is a subset of. Um, the of the sample space so something like rolling an odd uh, an odd number so this event would consist again events is is a collection of outcomes of the procedure right will consist of the outcomes and what uh, so we usually when we have a set we write it in braces so it would consist of the outcomes one, three, and set. Um, sorry, one, three, and five, right? So those are the events in. Uh, those are the outcomes in this event, rolling an odd number. Uh, and we can have other different descriptions of an event as well, right? We can have an event where. Um, go ahead and do this. So this is another event, like rolling uh, a number uh, less than five or something like that, right? So less than five would consist of the following outcomes. So less than five would consist of one, two, three, four, right? Five is not less than five. Five is not included in this uh, event, okay? Okay, and then and there are some notation that you have to know. Um, in, in this class, we are going to use a uh, the capital letter P represents probability. Uh, other capital letters, we denote, we used to denote events. So, for example, uh, capital A denotes event A, event B, event C are denoted by capitals B and C. Uh, and when we write, um, uh, when we write something like this, what we're saying, the way that we interpret this, uh, would be the probability of event A occurring. And the last notation is like uh, a capital letter uh, with a capital letter with a line over it. 
and that notation represents the complement of the event A. So for example, so uh, capital A with a line over it uh, is uh, denotes the complement of event A. And we'll talk more about this um, notation in a bit. Um, so let's move on to the next item. So the there are two ways uh, that we can calculate a basic probability. Again, this is like the level one uh, way of calculating probability. Later on, we're going to look at other ways uh, and other ways which are more complicated. But this is like the basic a fundamental way that you would use to calculate probability. So depending on the situation, uh, depending on the situation, we would view the calculating uh, calculation of probability the following way. So if we have a sample, if we have sample data of a, or a procedure, we would say the probability of event A um, is equal to the number of times A occurred divided by the total number of times the procedure was repeated. So it would be a fraction where the numerator was that and the denominator was this. Um, in other situations where we have equally likely outcomes, then we would, um, it would still, it, it would be a fraction, but then the, the way we would uh, quantify or the way we would figure the uh, probability out would be the number of ways A can occur over the total number of outcomes. So very similar, um, you know, the same similar way to figure it out. It's a fraction, but then the wording and the way that we, the things in which we look for is just slightly different uh, because of the different uh, situations, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at a couple examples where we can um, use one of these two uh, probabilities to, uh, or one of these two uh, formulas to find the probability. So for example, here we have, uh, a regular six-sided die is thrown for number one. Uh, what is the probability of getting an odd number? So the probability of an odd number. And again, sometimes I'm going to write a capital letter to represent an event, and sometimes I just write the description. Like, for example, I just wrote odd, right? So um, in a situation like this, this is would be more of an equally likely outcomes because we have six outcomes in a six-sided die, and all of them are likely. We're assuming that the die is a fair die, right? So, so the way we would in, uh, find probability is we would say, what, what are, how many ways can we get an odd, can an odd occur? So, how many ways can we get row an odd number? Uh, and we know that uh, that that's going to be three ways, and then out of total number of outcomes, so total number of outcomes is would be six. Uh, and this would be reduced to one half, which is equal to 0 0.5. So sometimes you're going to, uh, well, you can write it as a fraction, a reduced fraction, uh, or you can write it as a decimal. Uh, ideal, most of the times in this class, uh, the ideal uh, format is a decimal. All right, uh, and now I'm going to break this down to be um, more than it should. Uh, this problem is pretty simple to solve. But one way to think about it is that uh, the odds is 1, 3, and 5, and the, um, the, the sample space, right? Uh, the sample space is 1, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then you would just count, right? So th the different ways we can get an odd is 1, 3, 5. That's how we get the three uh, outcomes, and then 6 for the total sample space. Okay, so number two is a little bit harder. So number two, the question says, uh, we flip a coin. A coin is flipped three times. What is the probability of getting exactly two tells? So this one's a little bit more complicated because we gotta, we're, we're forced to think it uh, a little bit more. So, um, <clears throat> so let's use, um, in, in this problem, let's use like uh, capital H to represent uh, heads and capital T to represent getting a tell. Okay, so for something like this, uh, now we gotta think, well, what are the possible outcomes? Like, what are examples of outcomes that we can get from flipping a coin three times? So we can th we can think of, like, uh, an example would be like, uh, we can get heads, heads, tells, right? Getting a heads the first flip, and then a heads the second flip, and then a tells the third flip. 
and then we we can, another example would be like heads tails heads right so you can see there are a lot of different outcomes so let's um, let's try to com complete um, uh, write the sample space out to see uh, what we get uh, one way to do it uh, is a, a strategic way to figure out like the outcomes for for um, I'm sorry the yeah the, all the different outcomes for something where there is multiple trials or multiple um, yeah multiple trials is to create a tr something what we call the a, a, a tree diagram so a tree diagram for a situation like this would look like the following so we know so we know that in the first trial we can get a heads or a tell right and then in the second trial or second flip we can get uh, so for example like if we get a heads first the, the in the second flip we can get a heads or a tell so and then uh, this again this if you if you follow these branches this would represent the first flip getting a heads and then the second flip getting a tells oh, I'm sorry another heads and then or a tell and then from there we have one more uh, flip so if we get a heads heads we can also get a, a heads or then a tell and if we get the heads the first flip if we're considering that we get a tells the second flip in the third flip we can get a heads or a tell so each of these branches represents an outcome so again this is a tree diagram and each of these branches represents an outcome so for example like if you trace back from this branch this uh, end here represents the outcome heads 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 and for example this uh, end here this branch right here represents getting a heads the first flip a heads the second flip and then a tails the third flip and so on and we're not done with this tree diagram because then we got to consider well what if i get a heads or tells i'm sorry a tails on the first flip so let's work out that as well so then the possibilities for the second flip would be a heads or a tail and then if we get a tails the first flip and then the heads the second flip for the third flip we can get a heads or a tail and then this one again heads or a tail and then again uh, each of these branches represents um, an outcome so let's take a look at uh, let's kind of work our way backwards to see what we get so for example uh, the sample space so the sample uh, space would consist of the following and I'm gonna write the sample space just kind of going from uh, vertical from top to bottom so the first one would be heads 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 right if we if we start here we go up that's heads 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 and this one would be tells heads heads well, actually let's uh, it'd be heads heads tells right if we're working that way and it doesn't matter which way we work uh, just as long as we're consistent with how we write it uh, and then this one this end here would came from heads tells heads and then this one uh, right here came from heads tells tells <coughs> Uh, and then this end here came uh, from the uh, this outcome tells heads heads and then this one here um, tells heads heads I'm sorry tells heads tells tells heads tells and then this one would be tells tells heads And then the last one would be tells, tells, tells. Okay. So now that goes back to our question. So what is the probability of getting exactly two tells? So the probability is the number of ways we can get um, exactly two tells. So the, the ones which are exactly two tells is like this guy right here, um, this guy right here, and that guy. So three different ways we can get exactly uh, two tells out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight possible outcomes. All right, so that's the fraction that represents that probability. And again, we can take a fraction like that and then change it to, change that into a decimal. So that would be equal to 0 0.375. 
All right, so th again, th that probability um, would also fall into the equally likely outcome because it's equally likely that we can get a heads or a tails in each flip. And then finally, number three, uh, problem number three is an example of where to the we're going to be using this formula instead because we have sample data, right? So in this problem, it says below are final letter grades for a statistics course based on past semester. Find the probability of randomly selecting a student, randomly selecting one student who earned an A. So now we have we're using uh, sample data here. And again, we have to use this formula here, right? Because we're dealing with sample data, uh, and we we uh, we can't use the fact. So a common mistake a lot of students make when calculating something like this is to ignore the data, and instead think, well, there is one way to get an A, and that's if you get an A out of one, two, three, four, five. Um, possible grades. Uh, no, that we can't do that because it's not equally likely. Each of the outcome is not equally likely, right? It's not um, equal chance that you're going to get an A versus a B. There's just too many factors that go into getting a letter grade. So in this case, we have to use, we're using the data, uh, sample data here. So the probability of getting an A would be how many different ways can you pick a student who had who received an A and that's going to be 351 out of the total number of possible outcomes so there's 1238 students total and that's how that's how many possible outcomes there are okay and then we can change that into a fraction as well okay so we get approximately 0. 2835 is our answer in decimal form. All right. So there are a few more uh, problems. Um, I'm number four. I'll let you guys do that independently. Number five. Um, I'll let you guys do that um, independently as well. Uh, number six. I'll go over because it's. Uh, I want to make sure that you guys know how to read a table like this. A table like this is called a two-way frequency table. Uh, so it's very important that you know how to read this table so that you can answer um, questions um, in this section and other sections because you're going to be seeing this type of table a lot. So here we have results of, from a drug test for job applicants are shown below. So for example, the, this is the test positive, those who have the test, who tested positive column. This is those who tested negative column. And then along here, we have those who actually use drugs and those who do not, do not use drugs. So for example, like these five people, uh, they are those who tested, had a negative test, and um, they actually use drug. Right, so those five tested negative, but they actually they, and then they use drugs, uh, and then like these twenty-five people, they don't, they they do not use drugs, but they tested positive. All right, so that's how you read that. Uh, a good practice whenever you have a two-way frequency table is to just call um, add up the columns and rows so you know the total number of of people um, in here so on here or for each of the situations, right? So for example, if I add these two columns, this number, the 45 and the 25, uh, that tells me that 70 of, this, of the people, uh, of the job applicants, tested positive. 45 who use drugs and 25 who do not use drugs. So, and then if, if I add the two here, 480 plus five, 485 people uh, of the job applicants uh, test negative. Five who actually use drugs, 480 who do not use drugs. And I can do the same thing across. So those who use drugs is uh, are the 45 here who test positive and the five who test negative. So that's going to be 50. And then uh, 25 who uh, do not use drugs tested positive, 480 um, tested negative who do not use drugs. So for, there, for that one, you get 400 um, actually... Uh, 505 and you'll notice that to get the total number of job of applicants you can either combine the used drugs with the not, not used drugs or the positive with the negatives 
and you'll, you'll notice you get the same number, right? So for example, uh, 50 plus 505 gives you 555 total applicants if you're combining those who use drugs with those who do not. If you add the 70 with the 485, you also get 555. So 70 plus uh, 485 also gives you 555. All right, so just kind of, I'll just kind of put that up here just so I have it handy. Okay, now we can answer the question. So the question here says, find the probability of selecting someone who got a result that is uh, a false negative. So false negative, uh, that's a terminology we've not seen. So let me explain what that is. A false negative, well, let's go um, box by box and let me explain. So um, they, these 45 people here, these 45 job applicants, they tested positive when they actually use drugs. So that those positive tests are actually true positives, right? So these are true positives because they use drugs. It should be true that they um, tested positive. These, uh, whereas these five people, they tested negative um, when they use drugs. So if they use drugs, they should test positive, but because they tested negative, these are false negatives. So they are negative test results that are false because they actually do use drugs. They should have tested positive, right? And then these 25 people here, they tested positive uh, when they... Um, uh, when they do not use drugs. So if they don't use drugs, they should test negative, but then they test a positive. So these are false positive. All right, so they are positive test results that should not have came uh, positive. And then finally, these guys down here, the 480, they tested negative and they don't use drugs. So that was the correct thing that happened. So these are the true negatives. All right, and then in the problem here, it, the question asks, um, what's the probability that if you select someone, in one person, who and that result is an, uh, a false negative? So false negative, there's five of those people. So that's the number of ways that that can occur, right? If you select one person, one result, there's five ways you can get somebody who um, had a false negative out of how many total people? How many total results? 555. Okay, and then we're going to change this into a decimal. So we're going to change this to, in to a decimal by dividing. And there we go. So uh, rounded to four decimal places, this would be 0 0.0090. All right. So again, uh, you got to be familiar with those terminologies like false negative, um, false positives and then um, using this two-way frequency table you got to be able to figure out probabilities right and and we're gonna again we're gonna see this a lot so make sure you know how to read these uh, a table like this <clears throat> okay and then now let's look at complementary events so complementary events are the following so com the complement of an event a denoted a with a line over it you're gonna hear me read it as a bar consists of all outcomes in which event A does not occur. So it's pretty much non-A events or uh, non-A um, characteristics. So for example, if A represents the event of flipping a heads, the complement of A would be flipping a tails, right? Or flipping a non-head. Uh, if A represents rolling a five, then the complement of A would be rolling something other than a five or a non-five, which in this case would be one through uh, one, one, two, three, four, or six. If event A was picking a defective iPad, event A, uh, the complement of A would be a non-defective iPad. Okay, so let's just uh, solve um, a problem, a real quick problem with this. So we have a survey has 1,010 adults, 202 identify themselves as cigarette smokers. Find the probability of randomly selecting a non-smoker. Uh, round your answers to two to four decimal places. All right, so there there's a couple ways you can do this, but just real quickly, uh, we know there's 10, 10 adults, 202 identify themselves as smokers. So 202 are, are smokers. So we know the complement of smokers are the non-smokers. So everybody else is a non-smoker. So we know that 
uh, 10, 10, our total minus 202 smokers. The rest of them are non-smokers, so there's 808 non-smokers. And the, the question asks us to find the probability of a non-smoker, so we, we know that's going to be equal to 808 divided by 10, 10. So let's go ahead and, and work that out on the calculator to turn that into a, a decimal. So we get 0.8, right, 0 0.8 as a probability. Later on, you're, you're gonna, well, we're gonna look at a complementary formula where uh, whenever you, to find the, the probability of the complementary, complementary of A, that's equal to one minus the probability of, uh, of A. Uh, so for example, like 202, 202 divided by 1010 uh, is 0 0.2, and we could have found the 0.A by doing 1 minus 0 0.2. So that's something for later on that just kind of keep your um, keep it in the back of your head that we're going to be talking about. All right, and then the, the last part of, of um, this section uh, involves uh, unlikely events, using probabilities to identify um, unlikely events. So an event with a low probability, such as 0 0.05 or less, is considered unlikely. Okay, and this kind of brings me us down, uh, brings us to the importance of probability and how it fits into uh, statistics. So probability is very important in statistics because that probability is how we make decisions as statisticians or a researcher using statistics. Whenever um, a researcher or you know an experimenter conducts an experiment, um, they want to look at the result and to make any judgment or decision about an, the effectiveness of maybe like a drug that they, they're testing out, they have to look at, well, what's the probability or the chance of getting that result? And based off of that, uh, that is how they make their decision on whether something is effective or not. All right, and, and, and real quickly, the example I have here is like flipping five heads in a row is very unlikely since its probability is 0 0.0. 3125, right, which is less than 0 0.05. All right, so flipping five heads in a row is unlikely because the probability of that is very low. Now, later on in uh, the next chapter, we'll talk about how to how to calculate this probability. Okay, so <clears throat> just kind of continuing that uh, the idea that I ex I talked about, um, this concept right here is is. Um, it's very difficult to understand and to wrap your head around, uh, but then it's uh, if you can, um, if you're able to, you you know you're on your first step into understanding uh, what we're going to be talking about later on the, in the semester when it gets uh, really tough. Okay, so <clears throat> um, let's look at uh, this concept of the rare event rule for inferential statistics. So let me try to break it down into three parts. So it says, if under a given assumption, so let's kind of, there's three parts to it. So under a given assumption, the probability of a particular observed event is very small. So the second thing you want to take into account is that the probability of an observed, of an, an observed event is very small. And the observed event occurs significantly less than or significantly greater than what we typically expect with that assumption, we conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. So the assumption is probably not correct. So I've highlighted three different things and let me kind of, let's look at an example and I'll um, highlight those stuff as well in the example. So again, take take into account the, the the rare event has three components. It has we have an assumption, we have that the probability of a particular event is very small, and that particular event like is uh, different from the assumption, right? Either it's significantly less than or significantly greater than, and then our conclusion would be if if those two things are if that thing is met, right? If the probability is small, then this we assume we. We conclude, I'm sorry, we conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. 
and I should also highlight that as well, conclude that the assumption is not correct. So let me go ahead and let's look at this example and let me kind of highlight the stuff that I um, that I highlighted up there as well. So we have a study was done on the effect of seatbelts used in head-on car collisions. Assume, so again, that's what we're, we're assuming that seatbelts have no effect and that the survival rate, so what, what does that mean if the seatbelts have no effect, it means that the survival rate for drivers using seatbelts and drivers not using seatbelts was the same, right? Are the same. That's what our assumption is. The study found that drivers, and then they, that study was conducted. So this, this is where we're going to talk about the observed event. The study was conducted, uh, found that the drivers using a seatbelt had 64 point one um, percent survival rate while drivers not using seatbelts so seatbelts had that drivers not using seatbelts had a 41.5 percent survival rate if seatbelts have no effect on survival rate the probability of these results is less than 0 0.0001 what do you conclude Okay, so th a lot to unpack here. So again, the the rare event rule says if we assume something, right? So here we're assuming that seatbelts have no effect on survival rates for um, on survival rates, and but then the probability of a particular event is very small, like very small, such as in as this probability, less than 0.001. And the observed event, I didn't highlight that, but this is part of the probability as well, right? The observed event is less than, significantly less than, or significantly greater than what we typically expect with our assumptions. Again, we're assuming that uh, there's no effect, seatbelts have no effect, and that the survival rate for seatbelts and not wearing seatbelts is the same. However, this is significantly different. Our result here in the study was significantly different. For seatbelts, their survival rate was 64.1%. Uh, and then for not wearing seatbelt is is less, right? It's forty one point five percent. So they're they're significantly different. What do we conclude? So we conclude the following: the probability of the result is um, it it it's less than that, right? So this is is less than zero point zero 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 one. The probability shows that the sample results. <clears throat> could not, so this would be could not have easily occurred by chance. So when you have a probability, an event with a low probability, it couldn't have assumed by, it couldn't have happened by chance. Uh, in this case, especially if we assume that they should have been uh, equal, these survival rates should have been equal. If it's different, it probably didn't happen by chance. So we conclude, and again, the, the conclusion part is not part of the, uh, of the problem up here. It's what you have to. Um, it's what you have to derive that or conclude. All right. Uh, so we conclude that our assumption that seatbelts have no effect is probably um, is probably uh, wrong. It appears that there is sufficient evidence to conclude that seatbelts do not do have an effect on survival rate. So uh, again, this part right here is kind of taking a, a bigger leap. So we conclude that our assumption that seatbelts have no effect is probably wrong or you know, incorrect because these two survival rates are, are different. So, uh, and because they're different and because the survival rate for those who wear seatbelts is a lot higher than those who uh, did not wear seatbelts, um, we we say there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the seatbelts do have an effect on survival. Great. All right, so that's a lot of things uh, to kind of wrap your head around. Um, this part right here, you can read independently, but this last part is very difficult. Try to wrap your head around it. If you have any questions, again, um, either email me or uh, get on the forums on Canvas and um, you know, put a, put a question up there and we can discuss that. All right. Thank you.